Good morning. Welcome to WFL HCA. Our presentation today is a gentleman who's 39 years old, and so we'd like to talk a little about him. He's a gentleman who uh, has his own construction company, and uh, his recent medical uh, problems have interfered with his continued work. He's got a young wife and a child, a uh, baby, and uh, he uh, chose this occupation because he likes to be outdoors, and he likes to work with his hands. He comes from uh, a uh, distinguished family that goes back uh, 100 years in Tampa, and uh, he's living in the Largo area. Very nice gentleman, but he's unable to work uh, because of his symptoms. So I thought we would present this case uh, for some discussion because uh, he would like us to talk about him a little bit uh, because of the problems he's had. So. So the more information we have and the more we can discuss this, the better off we'll be in terms of uh, giving him some information. It's a very complex case, and so I'm glad you can help me here today. So this gentleman is a 39-year-old male who uh, basically uh, was referred by one of the academic doctors at the University of South Florida, and a physician, uh, family, friend, uh, also uh, referred him uh, by uh, a network of family friends that have been coming to this office uh, off and on over years. And so uh, he has been very concerned about a whole bunch of symptoms he's been having. He has, uh, and it's, as it was overwhelming when he first came uh, to contact with me and we talked on the phone and then we emailed back and forth and we text back and forth and his symptoms were overwhelming. Uh, in terms of palpitations, um, orthostatic hypotension, recurrent episodes of chest pain on mild exertion, um, can't uh, stand for a long time, uh, and uh, multiple abnormalities in his family with a family history of uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, and so he, he can't uh, function well at all and uh, and has difficulty on a daily basis uh, frequently and so for that reason uh, he came to see me. He uh, has had a overwhelming workup uh, so this is going to be interesting too to sort of sort through the data and uh, see what we can understand about uh, someone who uh, has become a a complex um, a sort of labyrinth wrapped in an enigma and uh, very difficult to sort out. So let's see what we can do with this. He used to be an elite, elite athlete. He works daily doing construction activities uh, and does all the work, footings, uh, framing, uh, lifting, uh, wheelbarrowing. He does everything. His uh, symptoms include but are not limited to uh, quite an assortment of stuff, including uh, exertional chest pain, rest pain, tingling of his arm, left arm pain, shortness of breath, palpitation, dizziness, lightheadedness, intolerance to heat, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, chronic fatigue, difficulty in maintaining the upright posture. He's never actually uh, passed out, to my knowledge, but he has uh, gone down. And uh, actually, there were so many symptoms that in order to sort things out, I said, let's go for a walk. And we did take a walk to the hospital and back, and uh, I didn't notice anything during that particular trip. But he says uh, things will come and go, and he's not sure when it's going to happen. So he reports chest pain, sharp, radiates through the back, chest, left arm, less than two minutes. He reports that upon standing, usually after prolonged sitting, bending over, squatting, falling, Wake up in the morning that he gets this chest discomfort, also dizziness. Also reports chest pain after exertion, after walking, running, biking, swimming. Chest pain is awoken him for sleep, a of shortness of breath, pounding of his heart, palpitations, left arm pain, burning feeling in the chest, nausea, dizziness, and lightheadedness. He's had some abdominal pain that spreads into the chest and down the left thoracic area triggered by uh, different kinds of positional changes, hitting car brakes, sitting down, standing up, bending over. 
pain in the back of his head, neck, left shoulder blade, headache. So the activities of daily life are basically being interfered with by this plethora of symptoms. Frequently experiences pre episodes, considerable lightheadedness, dizziness, mental fog. These uh, symptoms occur after a prolonged, uh, after sitting and then with prolonged standing, also related to exertion, which he's able to walk, run, bike, or swim, but he hasn't been doing these activities lately. Patient was repeatedly, uh, as a young, uh, well, a few years ago, basically, he, he basically got trampled by a cow on the family ranch, possible minor head injury, passed out and hit his head on a fence post. Uh, these are things that uh, he never got evaluated for. He, um, at work over time, patient noticed he would feel lightheaded when he got up from a squatting position, or he would bend over and reach the bed of his truck. He fell off his skateboard and hit the back of his head on the pavement very hard. No loss of consciousness. Uh, was not evaluated. Felt abdominal discomfort, CT of the abdomen, colonoscopy negative. Two-hour episode of shooting discomfort, the limbs, flushing sensation involving his face, both upper extremities, mild chest heaviness, lightheadedness, near syncope, sense of impending doom. All of these being very uh, uh, symptomatic and uh, multi-system symptoms that uh, are more whole body symptoms that uh, make it very difficult to understand what's going on in him. And so there's been several approaches trying to find a unified disease concept such as uh, elevated epinephrines and pheochromocytoma or carcinoid syndrome with hydroxy iodoacetic acid elevation, none of which was found. His EKG shows left bundle branch block, and we have a CT to show some images. So let's see what we can uh, come up with to show you here. So let's look at our uh, CT scan of this gentleman. Uh, he has a little bit of coronary calcification, the left anterior descending is the first thing we notice. And uh, it's a linear calcific plaque unaccompanied by any other abnormalities of uh, in terms of plaques in the coronaries. Let's take a look at color coding this. See what we can figure out. And, uh, as we look at this, just see this one area. You take the color off, it's easier to see. There it is. That one white area seen in the left hand two descending looks like on the septal perforator side somewhat linear to start with and then becomes nodular let's go down this artery and take a closer look and then we can go look at his other arteries right coronary, not a very big vessel, hypoplastic right, means he has a big circ, circumflex coronary artery, very large, looks like a diagonal vessel here, there is a diagonal vessel, it's hard to see the proximal part, and there it is, Let's take a little closer look at this in terms of the left hand here descending. And you notice as we go down the left hand here descending, it seems to, in the mid portion or more distally, get smaller down here, which appears to represent 
a distal myocardial bridge where the left anterior descending is taking a dive into the myocardium. We can look at this in several views. Let's look at this. So there's a distal bridge. question is, is there a proximal bridge up in here as well? And uh, it looks like that's taking a dive right there into the myocardium. There's myocardial above it. It's taking a dive right there into the myocardium and then taking a dive down distally here into the myocardium. So it looks like there's two areas of myocardial bridging. You can see this is straightened and usually it's not epicardial. It becomes, it take, you can see where it takes a turn and takes a dive into there and then straighten and then it exits and then comes down here and it sort of looks a lot smaller down there. And it looks like it's intramyocardial as well down here. So perhaps two intramyocardial areas, proximal and distal. And uh, this is, looks like it's embedded in the myocardium. So let's go uh, take another look at another view. Let's go over here, see if we can tell more. We'll take this off. And as we go along here, here's our area of proximal calcification with a, a linear calcification and then a nodular calcification. And then the bridge starts in there where it's intramyocardial, intramyocardial, and then exits, exits here. Here it's epicardial. We go back, intramyocardial, 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 and then exit again. Uh, yeah, so there's where it's actually going to the myocardium right there. So if we back off, now it's epicardial, it's epicardial, and it's epicardial. So this calcification is, precedes the bridge, but it's not immediately preceding the bridge. It's uh, There's a bunch of millimeters between... See, it's epicardio, 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 and now it's taking the dive. There it goes. Now it's intramyocardio, you can see, and then it's coming up to the surface, and then it's out again, right there. And let's go see if the distal area, and the distal area here is distally, and it looks like it's epicardio, epicardio, It looks like it's epicardial distally. It's just small, but it is epicardial. And the only area of bridging appears to be the proximal area. And there it goes into the bridge. And it's going into the myocardium. And now it's coming out of the myocardium. So that's the length of the bridge right there. And then the calcification is, is off a ways, it's off up here from the bridge, off a ways. And so it's a while. It's not immediately when it takes a dive. The calcification is not immediately there. It's a, looks like well over a centimeter from where the bridge enters the myocardium. So myocardial bridge, no big deal. 15% of people have myocardial bridges. And so let's see if we can see that with uh, this off of color and uh, there is the calcification and then we turn this sideways and there's the dive into the myocardium there you can see it, it's a little smaller down there so there's the bridge it's along here and then the exit area so very common to have bridging in the left anterior descending and the diagonal those are the most two frequent bridge to vessels. Bridging is very common in other species, seen in cows, a lot, of, a lot of bridging in goats. And so not an uncommon finding. Usually the bridge itself is not associated with atherosclerosis. And so we can show you people who have coronary artery disease and then it stops at the bridge. Coronary calcification stops at the bridge. And so the question is, is this part of his problem and what part might that be so let's go back and talk some more about this gentleman so we got left bundle branch block myocardial bridge palpitations and uh, problem uh, with blood pressure when standing at times so very complicated 
take this down. And uh, now we're going to switch over to Dr. Tariq for a minute, and he's going to show some more of this uh, information. All right, good morning, everyone. So I guess we'll just continue from where Dr. Harrison left off. And so basically after the CCTA, the patient also had a cath. And as you saw, did you already show the cath already? Should I pull them up? So we'll actually go to the cath images now. So just hold on for a second. All right, so. I think it's just a ventriculogram just showing a good contractility. Then we have the right coronary. Let me slow it down a little. And this seems to be feeling okay. There's no defect, no stenosis anywhere. This is right? Or, yeah. All right, so this is, you have the left main and then and then it's just filling into the other two branches again the same thing you have the LED and the circ going on the side and uh, everything seems to be feeling okay I don't really see the myocardial bridge on this as well So I think it's, they said it's supposed to be mid LAD. I don't know if I, if I can actually see a good image here where you, where you see a narrowing or any kind of stenosis. Maybe you see it's sort of like a bend going down, but it might just be because of motion you see that. Maybe, these, I don't know if there's something here. <laughs> Show this. Let's see, I think uh, Hassan on the first image you showed of the left. Let's go find that again. Is that him? There looked like it's some totally milking. Good. Some milking in the LED. In the first image of the left. So let's go back and look at that. Left ventriculogram, normal contractility, multipurpose catheter. Right coronary, and then there we go, systolic compression. Oh, yeah, so there's systolic compression seen right there. We can go frame by frame if you want to. We can slow her down. Let's do that. Slow her down. There we go. And we'll see systolic compression, milking of this segment of the intramyocardial LED. So it looks like it's best seen in this LAO projection. Uh, looking sort of sideways at it. So when you see it on FOSS, uh, it looks like a normal looking vessel, but when you see it uh, on a lateral view, sideways, you can see the compression within the myocardium. So a little bit difference whether you're looking on FOSS or whether you're looking sideways. And so like the soda straw effect. So we can look at some of these other images here. And uh, they usually give nitroglycerin. There we go. Starting to get some change on this one. And we can actually stop the frame when it's more impressive. And uh, sort of wheel through it here by turning the mouse. There we go. So we got this area of left ventricular systole and systolic compression of the intramyocardial segment of the left hand to sending it gets pretty narrow there so that's a nice looking bridge I don't see anything distally it goes the calcium should be up here dives into the myocardium moves along and then exits right there systolic compression shouldn't be a problem you uh, fill during diastole and so interesting looking bridge and so that's what was discovered, left bundle branch block, myocardial bridge, and uh, those are the two pathologies we're dealing with now. These are septal perforators coming off. 
this calcification is not well seen because it's not very big when it comes to coronary cath. What we saw was blooming artifact from a CT scan. Septal perforators are well visualized and the septum is well visualized. So you'd think there may be during systole certainly less blood flow through this little area here. So let's go on and take some more uh, information about this gentleman. It's becoming uh, very interesting now. All right, so just some of the findings, again, the intramyocardial bridge that you guys saw. And um, they said it's more a little, a little bit proximal to mid-LAD. That's where they see it. They don't see anything distally. And, but there's not complete obliteration, but there's definitely systolic uh, compression of it. Ejection fraction, as I said, was normal, and some diastolic dysfunction they saw. Now, because of the patient's other um, kind of symptoms, um, he also en ended up getting some evaluation, some imaging of the brain and his spine. So the MRI brain uh, did not show any atrophy or any acute or remote uh, infarct or mass in the brain and uh, they just saw some, uh, I guess, a little bit different uh, intracranial vessel, just the blood flow, the vessel distribution, there's just a developmentally hypoplastic vertebral artery, but otherwise there's not really any flow problems. The cervical spine MRI showed some early degenerative disease um, at the C6 and C7, so that might be what's contributing to some of his symptoms in terms of how he gets uh, pain down his arms and so on. And so so he definitely has a lot of other things which are contributing to his chronic fatigue or chronic pain and so on. The patient, because he's been having this lightheadedness, had a tilt table test. They did not show any orthostatic blood pressure drop. And this was at, when the patient was tilted at 70 degrees. Uh, there was no syncopal or presyncopal episodes at that time. The heart rate was 72 to 90. The, I mean, the peak was 110. He did have some symptoms during the test of chest tightness, heavy legs, tingling in his fingers, and heaviness in his stomach. And it was at that time thought that he maybe met criteria for POTS disease. So that's, uh, post, uh, that's postural orthostatic. Uh, orth is it orthostatic? and tachycardia syndrome. Uh, carotid ultrasound was done at that time. They did not see any significant stenosis. He also had a chest x-ray because of some pains in his chest, like back uh, back of the chest and so on, and uh, there wasn't anything found. Um, after his uh, episode in December, when he left, uh, he had a, a cardiac MRI and uh, they didn't see any delayed enhancement, so there was no scar seen or no evidence of any kind of myocarditis or any infiltrative disease. Because of his uh, symptoms of palpitations, he ended up going home with a Zio heart monitor. And the results of the Zio heart monitor showed that he had some rare PACs and PVCs. He had a stretch of SVT uh, where, where the peak heart rate was 156. And in terms of his symptoms, he felt like he was having some fluttering and racing heart uh, feeling, but they didn't seem to be have I mean have any coinciding uh, um, arrhythmias at that time when he was having these symptoms. Um, he also had then at another time got an event monitor, and this showed some SVT along with this left bundle branch morphology, and that lasted for more than 45, uh, I guess, uh, minutes. And most, some of these were asymptomatic, so he didn't seem to have any symptoms coinciding with these events. Also, long, I think sometime later, he had an EGD, which showed just some, some esophagitis. Um, in February, he went to the Mayo Clinic, and um, there, there was a bit of a concern when they looked at all of his imaging that maybe he had some ischemia at the myocardial bridge. And so they initially suggested a nuclear study be done to see if he actually develops any ischemia, but it was never done. We don't know what the reason was there. Um, he had an echo, which was completely normal at that time also. Um, later on in April, 
they did a repeat tilt table test because he continued to have these symptoms. All of these symptoms were kind of persistent and they were waxing and waning. So they, they kind of did another tilt table test and this time uh, again they showed no orthostatic hypotension or no tachycardia. Um, blood pressure drop was not too much and it was asymptomatic. He did have symptoms again as he did last time also. There was no hypoglycemia during these symptoms. So here they actually got, were more so questioned, well, does the patient actually have any dysautonomia or does he actually have any POTS? So there was some question as to whether to believe the results from the December test. And uh, so that's their conclusion from this uh, new study. He also had an echo again, it was normal. He was put on another Holter monitor to see if we were actually missing something also done at Mayo and um, just some sinus arrhythmia they noticed some changes in PVF morphology um, again they noticed some VPCs S, uh, VPCs some runs of SVT the longest being five beats with a rate of 116 um, he was symptomatic at times but then I think uh, also they didn't have any kind of arrhythmia as reported at this time some VPCs or SVPCs but nothing more than that. Some blood pressure drop also uh, during this time but then just sinus rhythm and not really anything major happening at these events. Um, later on he got a cath again and this time the idea was to actually interrogate the myocardial bridge to get an idea if um, it is actually hemodynamically significant. So they did an FFR which was found to be 0.9 did not see any change in it uh, when they infused it with the butamine and an atropine bolus. Also adenosine was uh, administered and, and they didn't see any change. There was a normal FFR response in terms of all the vessels to adenosine and there was a normal rise in acetyl, I mean in um, when they gave acetylcholine there was a normal rise that was seen. Now um, when they gave really high doses of acetylcholine, they saw some significant spasm at the side of the myocardial bridging and so there was a bit of a concern and this not just to span the myocardial bridge but also a few millimeters proximally or distally to the bridge and this suggested some sort of endothelial distal function. No symptoms were elicited uh, during the uh, procedure and there was no flow disturbance which was actually uh, noticed. So their conclusion at the end of it was that there's, this bridge is hemodynamically insignificant even though there is some endothelial dysfunction. And so whether this is what's contributing to his symptoms or the bundle branch, it was, uh, there was not really a clear answer there. Um, he also got some other workup done because of all of his uh, shoulder pains and chest pains and abdominal pains and uh, they looked at this MRI uh, right and left brachial plexus and what they could see on the left side was that there was some non-specific uh, changes and um, they said some increased T2 signal in the C6 to 8 nerve roots extending into the supra and retroclavicular region and so they said the findings even though they're non-specific might be suggestive of some possible neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome um, they noticed some jo small joint effusion in the left shoulder and so he definitely had some uh, kind of residual um, findings there maybe because of his history of trauma and so on and they might be what's contributing to his uh, pain symptoms or complex picture. MRI cervical spine was unremarkable, chest x-ray unremarkable, shoulder x-ray unremarkable and uh, because of his autonomic symptoms he had a thermoregulatory sweat test and it showed some anhydrosis I guess in the toes and so they, it was thought that he has maybe some residual or autonomic, I mean autonomic neuro, neuropathy. So considering all of this basically um, all the findings from the test and um, all the workup that he had previously done his past medical history included a left bundle branch block SVT, non-sustained PSVT and frequent PACs, a myocardial bridge proximal to mid LAD, cervical lift uh, disc disease, some vestibular dysfunction um, that was thought um, 
um, POTS disease, possibly sleep disorder because of all uh, these symptoms, just very complicated pictures, so he couldn't really get a good sleep. He was also very anxious about all of the symptoms and uh, just concerned if there was something more serious going on which was not being detected. And because of his family history, which I'll just mention uh, uh, soon, also had some chronic fatigue syndrome again because of all the pains and so on and inability to work and everything. It was all just making it very hard for him to carry on. So surgical or trauma history, so as we mentioned previously, he had these two uh, traumatic episodes. One was this uh, trampled by a cow when he was hurt all over. Uh, the other one was a skateboard incident and though both of these times he did not actually seek any medical advice. Uh, he had an inguinal hernia repair, a broken left wrist repair, a splenectomy for a ruptured spleen a while back and a nose reset. I guess maybe he had uh, a deviated septum or something. Uh, family history, so his brother had proxismal atrial fibrillation, mom also had atrial fibrillation, also depression, alcohol, addiction, father had high blood pressure and some colorectal cancer, and he had left bundle branch block in his uncle, aunt, and his grandmother from his father's side. He was taking uh, labidolol, vitamin, and vit vitamin D and vitamin B, no allergies, we already know, uh, mentioned that he's a construction worker and he used to chew tobacco and he did that for six to ten years but he stopped in December when he first noticed his symptoms. Um, no alcoholic drinks or illicit drugs. A physical exam was fairly, uh, basically unremarkable, nothing here. Um, his EKG as you can see here, this is at our office, so he, when he got the EKG you can clearly see the left bundle branch uh, um, here in the uh, ant anterior leads and some reciprocal changes in the lateral leads you can see. He had an echo here, and his echo seems a little abnormal, minus 17, anything uh, more than that is kind of uh, considered abnormal, but he's, you see this global kind of abnormal uh, echo strain, and I'll guess um, we can actually show it over there. Yeah, right. So if you can just wait, we'll just get you some more images of the echo. Log that you see here. see sort of a double bump on the septum. Posterior wall moves normally. So abnormal septal motion. Classical with left bundle branch block. Mitral valve looks good. Aortic valve looks good. Normal Doppler flow. Again, abnormal septal motion. Appreciated in all views. Normal mitral valve and tricuspid valve function. Normal chamber sizes. Normal thickness of left ventricular myocardium. That's it. Aorta, this will look normal again. Wobbly septum, common with left bundle branch block. No other abnormalities seen. So we also put the patient on an event monitor and um, here you can see that um, he actually had it for a good 21 days or actually, yeah, about 30 days. And um, in on this, you can see the patient was symptomatic at different times. And whenever he was symptomatic, we actually detected that he also had some uh, runs of atrial fibrillation. And this here is like a example of a strip where you can see an irregular rhythm and you don't really see the P waves very clearly. So, and you, all, you also have the baseline kind of left bundle branch in there. So in summary, basically, we have this patient who's got a very complicated picture. He's got multiple persistent symptoms, 
Um, that includes your chest pain, arm pain, shoulder pain, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, palpitations, dizziness, lightheadedness, and uh, intolerance to heat, light sensitivity, sound, and low energy, fatigue. Um, so many of the pains and symptoms were actually attributed to his history of traumatic incidents, and uh, he had cervical disc disease, he had possible neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, and he had chronic fatigue because of his symptoms. So many of his uh, um, symptoms were actually thought to be a result of uh, these things or these diseases. However, the patient also has cardiac problems, and it was thought that they might also be complicating the picture by contributing to his overall uh, health status at the point. And so basically the big problem here is that we have actually four, we have left bundle branch block, we're thinking of, we have myocardial bridge, we're thinking of, we have atrial fibrillation, which is pro, uh, pro, uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that we we think is also complicating the picture in terms of his symptoms, his palpitations, maybe dizziness or lightheadedness. And he also has this kind of autonomic problem, this POTS syndrome possibly, which is also complicating the picture. So this was all just making it very hard for the patient to carry on. And so we discussed with him some possibilities as to what needs to be done. The patient was very concerned and he was still unsure if the myocardial bridge was really responsible for his symptoms. He wanted to see if more can be done to get an idea if uh, it was actually contributing or causing any kind of ischemia. So we suggested that um, the patient um, uh, get like a PET-CT by Dr. Lance Gould in Houston and, um, in the, and get a very good idea as to if the myocardial bridge is indeed causing any kind of ischemia in the LAD and that's what's contributing to either his left bundle branch block or maybe um, some other uh, symptoms that he's now having. Uh, the insurance, however, did not improve the t uh, approve the test and the patient later on just decided not to get the test on his own. Um, patient, however, opted to go and see Dr. Ingla Schnit Schnitker, who actually is a specialist and she's actually done a lot of research on myocardial bridges and the hemodynamics at Stanford previously. And so the idea here was do we actually just continue conservative management because we think that this is not hemodynamically significant as previously shown on the cath that the patient had or do we actually do an uproofing surgery where you would actually take, uh, where you actually pry out the segment uh, from the myocardium to make sure it's not actually getting any uh, compression during systole and so on. We also thought that maybe because of the familial uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, maybe the patient also has some genetic predisposition to get that. And so we suggested that he get some genetic testing because I think there's three genes uh, linked to it where you have two that increase the chances and one that's actually more protective. And so I'll pass this on to Dr. Harrison, who will talk to you about what Dr. Schnitker does. Okay, well, there's always someone that uh, will see an opportunity where the rest of us see only confusion. And so that's great because uh, Dr. Schnitker, who's at Stanford, has decided to uh, become an expert with her group in myocardial bridging, which is something now called precision medicine where you look at something that has never been explored before and you try to pinpoint that in individual patients and how it's hurting the patient. Let's go back for a second and we'll, we'll talk about uh, the genetic testing was actually before he had documented atrial fibrillation and so we said maybe he's having atrial fibrillation and we don't know it. Maybe because of the family history, uh, maybe we should uh, look and see if he's got the predisposition to atrial fibrillation. We didn't need this anymore because we found he had atrial fibrillation, so that got us out of trouble. Let's see what's, uh, what Dr. Schnitzer does, and uh, she's a, a stereotypic uh, German in that uh, I tried to get her to come to a webinar to review the case uh, with Dr. Uh, Tobis, uh, John Tobis, who's at Cedar sinai who uh, is a interventionalist par excellence and has had a lot of experience with myocardial bridging and stenting and uh, she said I don't have time for that I am busy with lots of clinics and so she didn't understand that I was 
taking care of Mr. Ward and was his doctor. And uh, so for some reason, uh, she said she couldn't come. But after that, she was very apologetic. And, uh, and basically, uh, these are some of the research things that she's done. So here's a gentleman who, in the cath lab, had acetylcholine, adenosine, and dobutamine uh, during the same cath table uh, experience. That's amazing. Uh, and, of course, the acetylcholine short-acting, the adenosine short-acting, dobutamine's a little longer-acting, so they probably did the dobutamine last. That, that is amazing that that, uh, that was done. So let's see what she does, and how does she evaluate people with myocardial bridges? This is very curious. And so here she says, because myocardial bridging creates a dynamic stenosis, which is systolic, brought on by chronotrophic and idotrophic stimulation, simply dilating the artery with the denison is insufficient. Well, I'll buy that because we do that when we look at patients who have coronary artery anomalies that have the so-called malignant course that uh, run between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And so we're interested in dynamics with that. And so adenosine is not our preferred uh, choice of a chemo stressor. Uh, we like to do dobutamine. We also do a fluid challenge with it to make it even more significant and more like exercise. So I agree with what she has to say, okay? Likewise, myocardial bridges cause significant diastolic pressure gradients. Well, I'm not sure about that. We'll have to figure out more about that because that particular bridge seemed to look like a normal coronary during diastole, and, but not during systole. And so... Um, so I, I, it was, it's actually the compression was during systole, not diastole. diastole. Now, we, do, we can show you some narrowing of patients' coronary arteries that's a diastolic as well. We can show you those, but this did not look like one of those in the, in the pictures that we looked at, uh, both the pictures on the CT uh, as well as the pictures on uh, the cardiac cast that he had. Okay, so let's see. Okay, that's we'll take that as uh, her observation. This produces, uh, in some patients, this produces an artificial elevation in the mean pressure used by traditional FFR, and that, that could be too. Again, resulting in an underestimation of hemodynamic significance. Possible. Therefore, diastolic FFR with dobutamine challenge is her technique of choice in testing for hemodynamic significance. But there's a problem with that. And so with this gentleman getting more and more ectopy, which is atrial, and now having episodes of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, you saw he had like maybe 10 episodes during a 20-something day monitoring period, that it's more likely he may develop PAF at the time of the dobutamine challenge. In addition, left bundle branch block certainly causes diastolic uh, systolic problems with systolic perfusion and also left ventricular wall motion abnormalities. And so you see, you saw the, wo the wobble that occurred uh, on the echocardiogram. So there's decreased myocardial perfusion that's seen on spec scanning and PET scanning either at rest or during stress with left bundle branch block. That's why the indication for a chemo stressor to look for perfusion defects and to not see uh, a defect that's due to chronotrophic stimulation. Uh, we don't do usually dobutamine. We usually do persantin that doesn't increase the heart rate. And that's why we don't do stress tests and have patients exercise when they have left bundle branch block. It's usually a chemo uh, test that we do, and it's usually persantin is the drug of choice. So this is the baseline on a patient uh, that uh, has a bridge, and there's no abnormalities. And then during diastole with a myocardial bridge, we're seeing this uh, diastolic pressure that's changing, and then distally it looks pretty good, and proximately it looks pretty good. And so the, there's a change that's happening uh, systolically, of course, that looks the same as distally, and then there's a change that's occurring in diastole in this particular patient that she tested. And so this is the myocardium seen on the IVIS, when a patient has a bridge. And so, okay, half moon sign is what it's called. And then she does stress echoing on patients. 
and she says stress echo has been shown to identify myocardial bridges. Specifically, one sees a unique wall motion abnormality of mid-septal buckling during peak stress, which distinguishes itself from a fixed left anterior descending stenosis by not involving the apex. Well, that, that certainly will be true. Unfortunately, with left bundle branch block, we also get an abnormality of the septum not involving the apex. We also, with dobutamine, see that occur in the left ventricular septum, but not the apex. It says the most significant increases in flow velocity and decrease in diastolic pressure are almost invariably located within the myocardial bridge, not distal to it as was traditionally thought. We have postulated a Venturi-like effect. And so, unfortunately, stress echo is not going to be helpful because of abnormal septal motion that occurs with left bundle branch block. And so this is sort of a picture of what happened. Here's the buckling. This is what their sighting occurs. And I'm not sure how we're going to, we could possibly sort that out with a patient who has left bundle branch block and has abnormal septal timing and motion as well. But this is an example of the buckling that uh, she wants to show. Myocardial bridge and plaque. There's an ongoing misconception about the location of plaque in relation to the myocardial bridge. The maximal plaque burden is not at the entrance of the bridge, but on average of 20 millimeters to 30 millimeters proximal to the entrance of the bridge. And well, that's true in this gentleman. That's a good point, and it's uh, certainly very true because we saw that area of coronary calcification in the left anterior descending. And exactly, it was 20 to 30 millimeters proximal to the entrance of the bridge. This may be attributable to the reversal of systolic flow seen on Doppler tracings in which retrograde flow collides with anterograde flow, causing a high st systolic wall shear stress, and probably saying axial stress as well, upstream from the bridge uh, entrance. And so, as you know, myocardial bridges, the coronary arteries don't get atherosclerosis. And so we can show cases of people that you got all this calcification and atherosclerosis and you get to the bridge and it's perfectly clean. Uh, and the calcification stops, the atherosclerosis stops. So, and then the ultimate goal uh, of Dr. Schnittger is uh, to get some relief in the symptoms. And so she's gone from uh, diagnosing the bridge to unroofing the bridge. And she's got 50 adult patients who during this period of time, about four years, underwent the unroofing procedure. First they did it on pump, heart lung machine, the first 35. The last 50, 15 were done off pump on a beating heart. So you don't have to go on the heart lung machine. And the results using the Seattle Angela score showed that the prior to the surgery, patients were having a lot of symptoms uh, and 75% uh, were having symptoms and there was just a flip where 78% uh, were not having symptoms and uh, basically had a significant relief of symptoms. And these are some of the references that we got uh, from this. So this patient uh, being denied uh, by insurance to go to Dr. Gould, having now tipped his hand that he does have atrial fibrillation, we don't know if he has POTS or not. POTS is, is a diagnosis that's difficult to make, probably doesn't have POTS. Certainly has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is familia. Left bundle branch block should be asymptomatic. Uh, and so now we're left with all of this. And he's decided, hey, I'm going to go see if I can get relief. I can't stand this anymore. Dr. Schnittner seems to have the answers. Uh, I'm going there. Get the testing, which is going to be very difficult to collaborate, could, to corroborate uh, that this patient has pressure abnormalities during diastole with dobutamine challenge, which can lead to to paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, left bundle branch block distorting the data, and left bundle branch block certainly would distort a stress echo. So it's going to be very difficult to prove this, and it may be that with an, an, an act of faith or a leap of faith that this patient will go for the unbridging technique, the unroofing of the bridge, and uh, we'll see what happens. So patients with all these symptoms are certainly going to try to go uh, to somewhere where someone's going to promise uh, the potential of some relief of symptoms. And the potential does exist, exist given the, the Seattle uh, score of angina that the patients have shown. Uh, but of course, as you know, this is not a randomized study. It's not blinded. And uh, there's a lot of benefit 
from just doing a sham operation or doing any operation. And so we'll see what happens. It should be very interesting. And I'm sorry that we couldn't pursue this more. It's interesting to see all the workup this patient had at Mayo Clinic, which is, uh, this patient was in Rochester at the main Mayo Clinic and uh, had a chronic fatigue syndrome clinic visit, fibromyalgia clinic visit, ENT, EP, general cardiology, general internal medicine, and uh, just a fantastic uh, bunch of tests that were done. This is an abnormal test, but this is because of left bundle, and so you get an abnormal uh, abnormality of the strain echo, and a very complex patient will, will give you some follow-up on what happens to this patient. Uh, further, if the patient does get the bridge fixed and gets the unroofing, he's still going to have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which appears to be very frequent. And so then we embark on the EP experience of atrial fibrillation and whether this should be uh, basically uh, ablated or not with cryoablation or microvation. And uh, then we still got uh, the problem of the left bundle, which should be asymptomatic. And, uh, and then we've got some question about dysautonomia. And as you see, the tilt table test is not a very good test. Uh, and uh, positive in a lot of people who have nothing wrong with them. And so it's very difficult to sort out dysautonomia, uh, POTS, and normal responses on a tilt table test. Uh, and I quit doing the tilt table test because of the confusion and sorting stuff out. Thank you very much uh, for your attendance, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.